as much as you put into the National Guard, you're going to get out of the National Guard. Mm. Uh, there is no doubt that the National Guard and, or, or the regular Army or any of it is, is, is a good fit as long as you're fitting in good. welcome to the military bottom line podcast where we learn from veterans and those currently serving how to make the most out of a military contract we're here to motivate inspire and help you leverage your service to positively impact you professionally personally and financially during your military career and beyond Welcome to episode 37 of the Military Bottom Line Podcast. On this week's episode, I speak with Jamie Grant. Jamie did 22 years and six months in the Alabama National Guard. Joined to try to use it as an avenue to get through PA school and get that paid for. Um, But turn of events ended up with him in Special Forces uh, and doing some pretty cool stuff from Africa to Afghanistan, to drug missions, um, and and counteracting uh, drugs here domestically. And so he's got a lot of cool stories, a lot of crazy stories. Um, And so I think you guys will enjoy the show. I apologize for a weak connection, um, but uh, I think it's still worth listening to. So I hope you guys enjoy it. What's going on, Jamie? Thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks, Jason, for having me on on your show. Absolutely. I, I know you're, uh, you're friends with Jacob from uh, just two episodes back, and he spoke very highly of you. So I'm looking forward to kind of hearing your story. I know you've had a long career in the military, and uh, I'd love to kind of get a snapshot of what that looked like and, and uh, you know, hear all the wisdom that you have to, to share from that. So. Well, I don't know about much wisdom, but uh, I'm not sure you can put 22 years into a snapshot. We'll do the best we can. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Well said. Well said. Well, I mean, you know, let's start with a little bit of, uh, you know, the beginning. It's like, you know, what made you join and, and pursue it in the first place? Uh, so actually, I, I joined after three. I, well, my, my fame, my, I guess my fame is, is I, I graduated college in three years. Uh, unfortunately, it was a junior college. Mm, so, okay. uh, so, uh, so I was in, I was in college and, uh, I was getting ready for the end and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. And so my dad been in the military, uh, he said, you need to join the military and, and let the military pay for your college. Uh, because I've already paid for two years of it or three years of it. So let the military pay for the rest. So I joined the military to go to PA school to be a position mm-hmm. assistant. Uh, so I said, Hey, man, that's a great idea. And so, um, we have this this great plan because uh, you have to get accepted. So I joined. I, I went to uh, to be a combat medic. Uh, so I, I go to boot camp, which was to me the greatest thing ever. I loved boot camp. <laughs> I could have went every day. I, I loved I loved how they just crush you every day and build you up. And it was just the camaraderie. It was just, it was just fun to me. Yeah. Uh, and so I uh, went to boot camp. Went to out to, to uh, Fort Sam Houston to medic school. Uh, I did a really, I mean, I thought I did a really good job. My, my instructors loved me. They wrote me all letters um, to get into PA school. I come home. Uh, I had generals drop me, uh, I guess it was letter of recommendation to go to PA school mm. and uh, never got accepted. Okay. And why? Because my, well, because my, my GPA was too low because in college I, I, I didn't try. Mm. High school, I didn't try. I just skated on by <laughs> uh, until I really wanted to do something and, and gave forth my effort, but it was too late. Mm. Uh, and so I failed, you know, here I am, this failure can't get into school, mm. uh, which, which is okay. You know, so it's okay to fail. It's not, I mean, it's, you know, and, and I, I try to tell these kids, it's okay. As long as you're pursuing something, it's okay to fail. Don't, yeah. don't think that you're a loser for failure for failing, but it's, it's, it's okay. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so that was my, it, that was my reason. And, and I, and I tell, I tell kids every day, I said, there's, there's two people who join the military. One, the one who knows exactly what he wants to do, and he uses the military as a stepping stone, uh, and the one who has no no direction in life and who needs the military to give him discipline and direction. Mm. And uh, and I happen to be the one who was going to use the military for my to pursue my career, mm. and unfortunately, it just didn't pan out. So I had to go into a different direction, and it's worked out. Don't get me wrong, because because that's what the military does. You know, <laughs> if you use it the right way, it's going to work. Right. Absolutely. So, so did, did you join active duty? I, I think I missed, missed that. Right off no, I joined that. the Guard. The Guard. No, I joined the National Guard. Okay. I joined uh, the one, because the 152, 
which is a t armored tank division. Mm -hmm. But I was a medic, and then I came home and I was a scout medic for uh, for two years before I ended up transferring to another unit. Awesome, awesome. So I'm curious, like you know, when you say you failed at becoming, you know, getting to PA school, how what was that like, and how did you decide to, you know, kind of cut that and not continue trying and but instead move on to a different opportunity? Uh, so I so I tried three times. Uh, okay. So uh, there's a. Uh, the PA school only allowed so many soldiers in per year. Mm. Uh, and then the, the, the requirements just kept stacking up. Hey, you had to have these, the, these classes, these scores, these things, and they just kept piling. Gotcha. Um, and then I would, I would apply, denied, apply, denied. Mm. And then finally it just, it just wasn't going to happen for me. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, then there's a side, Hey man, maybe it's just not the route I need to be taken. Yeah. Uh, and then the unit I was in changed from a, tank division that went chemical and i knew i was not going to be in a chemical unit <laughs> so that's when i changed over to an uh, uh to an sf unit i went to a special forces unit after that awesome okay so I, I imagine within that you still got some of that medical experience that you were hoping to get some of that medical training i did so that medical training obviously uh was huge uh throughout your career i mean because you, everybody always wants a team medic yeah uh, and i actually use it for for my entire career Awesome. Uh, so, so every training, every time you can cross train, uh, you can always use that to your advantage. Mm. Um, so I, I carried, I actually carried that with me still today. I mean, I, you can always, I mean, there's a, there's a car wreck or anytime you can use your medical training. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's true. Um, I, I apologize if I missed it. What, what year was this that you or originally joined? So I joined in 1996. Um, uh, went off, yeah, went off to boot camp in uh, AIT and came home in 97 from AIT. Well, I, I'm, I haven't met many people that joined pre nine 11. And so like, I've always been interested in what that would be like to join at a time of peace. And then shortly thereafter, find yourself in like a, a you know, a large conflict kind of thing. And what, what was that like? I mean, did you expect that to uh, or, like, were you actually like, that willing to take that on when you first joined or were you thinking like, I'm just doing this for school. There's nothing going on. There's no chance of anything like this happening. I mean, how, what was that like? Well, uh, no, you really don't. I mean, obviously it's just like, and I, it's just like teachers that, that I guess they have to get it, a teaching degree. You want to teach, mm. uh, you know, if you go to practice every day to be a baseball player, you want to get in the game. Yeah. Uh, so I, so the mindset for a soldier is, is when you train every day and, and obviously nobody likes the thought of war, but sure. you want to go do your training and, and see what, see how good your training is. And That's so you, when you deploy and, and nobody knows what a slot do in, in deployment, but whether your job is to go get into a conflict, get outside the wire, because once you're in it, you're in it, but, but we all want to deploy and, and have that, have that satisfaction of doing their job during, yeah. during the war. Absolutely. And not just going to boot camp based training and, and getting all this training and doing nothing with it. Yeah. So once we're trained, we want to use our tools and go use them. Yeah. Yeah. There can be a lot of disappointment in, uh, in training, you know, <laughs> day after day, year after and, year, and never actually doing it. And, and, never, and never using it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No yeah. And we, and we want to see how good we are. I mean, obviously, the United States Army and Navy and, and Marines were, were, were highly trained and highly skilled. Mm. And we want to go see how good we are. Yeah. And obviously, and we're always proving that. I mean, no matter what conflict we get in around the globe, we prove how well trained and how well equipped we are mm. every time we get into something. Mm. And that just goes to show from, from, from top to bottom, you know, how, how actually good we are at training and yeah. how good we are once we get into it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm curious, like how, you know, you, it sounds like within your, the story that you mentioned that you were able to kind of make a pretty quick transition out of, you know, accepting that quote unquote, you know, failure uh, and moving on to something else. But how, how did you like mentally get over that? Um, if that was kind of like the life goal and life pursuit at the time, uh, how did that affect you mentally? You know, and like, how you uh, well, you just have to, yeah, I mean, you have to, I mean, there's a, you have to accept the fact, hey, I'm not getting in, and then you have to reach, you have to decide on a new goal, yeah. and then so uh, the new goal was my dad was was a he was a Green Beret, he was a a star major in Twin Space Forces Group, and then he says, okay, well this is this is not going to work out for you now. What are you going to do? 
Mm. Um, and then so there was a the, the uh, an opening in the unit to be intel. So I went intel, uh, and so I went to to hit to his unit to, to battalion. Got an MOS there. Went to jump school. Went to intel school. Cool. And then uh, the, the rest is history. Cool. So you, you had you had a good um, you know kind of mentor kind of like pushed you on to the next step rather than wallowing in like a in like a self pity kind of thing that you know, absolutely like, man. I mean it, well. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah. If you put, uh, if you surround yourself with people who want to help you be successful, and you want to help them be successful, then you're going to find yourself in that. Uh, you can you can put yourself in the wrong unit. You can put yourself around the wrong individuals, and if you're pushing them, they're pushing you. The only thing left to become is is successful. You know, and if you're always pushing people to be successful, the byproduct of that is you becoming successful. Mm. Yeah, because you're not just going to sit around and watch everyone else. If you're pushed to be successful, then then it's going to drive you to mm. become something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so tw- you said 22 years total um, of service, right? 22 years, six months. 22 years, six. Not months. That I was counting the last. <laughs> not that I was counting the last six. <laughs> I mean, you might as well. Every day counts for something, right? Yeah. Um, and and w- it was active duty, but within the National Guard. Is that accurate? So. Yeah, so I was uh, you break it up a little bit. So I was uh, I was on what's called a counter drug program, um, which actually started because there wasn't a war. Uh, so it was it was Nancy Reagan. Uh, she says, "Hey, we've got to combat this war on drugs." Mm. Uh, so she said, "Let's put National Guard to help local law enforcement agencies uh, to battle this war on drugs." So how can we get them involved? Mm. And so it was started way back in the in the late eighties. Uh, when they, they were National Guard members and they put them in local law enforcement agencies and we started helping them. And so I actually came on the program in 1999 uh, where I, when I was a medic and I would go on high risk search warrants as a medic in case somebody with the, with, with, got hurt on a high risk uh, search warrant or drug raid. Hmm. Um, and then as it evolved, I was a, a criminal analyst or an intel analyst. We would do different things. Um, and then for 20 years I was on the program, on the counter drug program, uh, traveling around doing, doing different things. No kidding. Were, were those a lot of, uh, I mean, were those like domestic deployments or were you actually going, you know, south of the border and things like that? Or, or what did that totally? So I was in, I was in Alabama, of course, all 50 states and and two territories, two territories have, have that program. I was in Alabama. Uh, but, uh, like some states have what's called a five alpha mission where they actually own marijuana plants or, um, lab and that kind of stuff and do different things. Um, and of course, California, Texas, they have huge programs because they have lots of fast regions mm. uh, where marijuana plants grow. And yeah. then sometimes we go in, it's called Wack and Stack. We fly around, look for marijuana plants growing, uh, we, we'll, then we'll cut the plants down uh, and that kind of stuff. Interesting. Okay. And, and I mean, is that something that you expected that you would be doing as part of the National Guard? I feel like that's not like. Uh, uh, no, this no, we did not expect that. It's just, uh, it's just kind of something that, uh, that just kind of with my MOS just kind of happened. Uh, yeah. Opportunity came open. Uh, they needed a, an analyst uh, down in at uh, U.S. Customs in Birmingham. Uh, applied, got the got the slot, and then uh, went from there to other counter other narcotics agencies throughout this uh, between deployments and. And job openings, and ended up in Edible County the last ten years, uh, working as a criminal analyst. Awesome, awesome. What are I mean? So it sounds like I mean you've had a long career, and obviously twenty years is a, is a long time to cover. So we won't we won't touch on everything. Um, sure. But how did like how did you find, and how did you know what opportunities were worth pursuing? Uh, you know, I feel like a lot of people they just kind of like fall in line and they end up wherever the military puts them, um, but I mean, you've done a lot and you've, you've, you've seen a lot. And so there's gotta be a way to kind of direct your career. Were you always looking for those opportunities or did you well, just take them as they came? Uh, so obviously you try to, you try to find, you try to find that, it, like if you're in your unit, you try to find that NCO, right. Mm-hmm. Who is, who is squared away and doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. I'll find the guy who's just, a week and a month or kind of hanging out 
yeah. and never seems to be getting promoted. You know, if there's a, if there's a, E5 has been E5 for 10 years, well, why is he an E5 for 10 years? Mm-hmm. You know, but if there's a, a young e, E78, well, you know, he's obviously doing something right. Yeah. And so try to, try just like anything else, you try to find that guy who's, who seems to be well-rounded, seems to be versatile and seems to kind of be, I won't say in the know, but just doing the right thing. Mm. Right. And and you, as much as you put into the National Guard, you're going to get out of the National Guard. Mm. Uh, there is no doubt that the National Guard and, or, or the regular army or any of it is 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 a good fit as long as you're fitting in good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. I mean, it's like with anything else. I mean, you can get in a bad click in the in the military. I mean, there's there's bad groups everywhere. Yeah. And if you're not doing the right thing, it's going to find, it's going to find you. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think a lot of people, I mean, yeah. I mean, finding those good people to kind of like, you know, group yourselves with and, and knowing that those people are going to bring you forward rather than bringing you down. Um, Cause like you said, you can, you can find a bad group no matter where you are and, and they can kind of hinder absolutely. you. Through. So yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a pretty critical, critical component. Um, how did you decide, I mean, when you joined, did you expect it to be a 22, 22 year and six month career, or did you think it would be kind of, uh, more of a temporary, temporary thing? Uh, so I actually, I, I mean, at, at one point I thought I was going to get out and go into like pharmaceutical sales or something. Uh, hmm. I had finished my degree. I have a degree in business. So I had finished my degree and I was like, I'm going to get out and go into pharmaceutical sales to make more money. But I just wasn't, I mean, and obviously it didn't work out because I think everything, everything's for a purpose. Everything's for a reason. You know, I'm not in control of anything. Yeah. Uh, so it just didn't, it just didn't work out. Um, and obviously I'm glad it didn't cause you know, I loved what I did every day. Uh, I tell people and they obviously kid me back. I said, I never went to work a day in my life. They say, yeah, we know Jane, we didn't see you much, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, if, if, if it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter. I mean, money's not success. Uh, mm-hmm. Success is is what you is what you produce and what you put into society and what you get back. It's not it's not got nothing to do with money. It's got nothing to do with what you drive or what you live in. It's got nothing to do with 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 your family, um, and 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 how happy your 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 wife and kids are. Uh, it's got nothing to do with with materialistic things. Yeah. Uh, and so that's it's just it's just how it's, and I'm not sure how we got on this on this part of it, but, oh, but see, it's just I, I about. Love it. I love it. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, and as far as I think I was going to stay in, you know, I had, I had no idea. Uh, I, I probably knew once I hit the eight in your mark, I wasn't going to get out mm-hmm. or at least I hope I didn't because I was too close to, to stand in to retire because it's obviously it, it pays pretty well and, and, uh, retirement's good. Yeah. Uh, but I loved, I loved, I, I loved deploying. I loved training with my, with the guys. I, I loved, you know, and somebody had asked me, uh, when I got to retire, what, what was I going to miss the most? And I was walking through the barracks cause I was the acting first sergeant. And mm. I said, this is what I'm going to miss with the cleaning, the weapons, the hanging out. Mm. Uh, that was what I was going to miss as far as the military, just yeah. hanging out with the guys in the barracks. Yeah. The community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I made, I made so many friends, so many lifelong friends that, uh, I mean, at, at basic training, I was, uh, he was in my wedding of uh, Russ Anderson. He was in my wedding. I was in his and, and mm. we were together for, you know, for, you know, 12, eight weeks at boot camp, And, and then we're, we're friends forever. You know, yeah. Logan, we've been employed together. You know, we're from 07. We're still, we're still, I mean, well, obviously when you're in so many firefights, you're going to be friends, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, I mean, and, but it's just, the, the military just brings a bond yeah. uh, that college I think just can't mm. um, because when it, when, when it sucks, it sucks. And when you're there together, it's just, there's nothing like it. Yeah. And you laugh about it now, but it hate, you, you hate it then. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. It, it's a recurring um, theme. Like the, uh, the worst times make the best memories, you know? And so. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, you, you can't, you know, that's, those are yours forever. So I, I hear yeah. you on that. Um, I'm curious. I mean, you mentioned, you know, family uh, and you, you've been in a long time. I think you're, you said you were married for like, the majority of your career is is that correct? Yeah. So, uh, so all of it. So we actually got married thinking that I was going to get accepted into PA school <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> because if I got, if I got accepted, we would be moving to Texas. I mean, cause my dad said, Oh, I'm going to get you in. You know, yeah. we have all the connections. Uh, you know, we have generals that are friends. Well, I want to get you in. Uh-huh. So I come home from AIT like in, I guess, March, maybe or 
yeah, something like somewhere in early March. And he's like, oh, I'm going to get you in, you know, either this next class or the next. You're, you're a shoe in. And, and all your all your all your instructors wrote you letters of recommendation. I mean, I was a peer, I was a peer tutor at, mm-hmm. at, during MOS school. He goes, they love you. You're, 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 you're a shoe in. Uh, so we got married like, I guess, six months later. I mean, of course, my wife and I were dated for two years and we've known each other since we were six. Okay. So it's not like I just met this random girl to marry. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we've known each other for 40 years. Yeah. So uh, and we've been married for, for 23. So it's not like it's just a random person. Yeah, of course. So I guess yeah. I guess that uh, that lengthy history makes it, you know, I assume that would play a role in your answer. But I mean, you know, balancing that with a military career where, you know, you had an expectation, you know, going into that marriage, but at the same time, um, you know, it didn't work out. And so you went through deployments, you went through a, a long military career where there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, w- what kind of advice and wisdom can you share for how people can balance that and, and ensure that, you know, both prove fruitful and, you know, healthy? Yeah. So, uh, so when you're home, put your family and your wife first, man. Uh, mm-hmm. And then when you're gone, whenever you have the opportunity, uh, call them, tell them that you love them. Uh, let them know that you're there for them. And obviously as the support group and when, and the military does a really good job, have a support group. Um, and then, and then whenever you're gone, know that they're, know that the military is going to take care of them. Mm. Know that, that when something's happened, um, uh, in, in 17, I had a, well, I've had a few accidents, but in 17, and I had a horrendous when eighteen wheeler hit me, and mm. she she was had an outpouring. I mean, the outpouring of phone calls. The military was taking care of me. Uh, I mean, never missed a paycheck. Insurance. I mean, they just the military is not going to let their own. I mean, you see terrible stories on TV or internet or wherever, and mentally, I just haven't seen that. And 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 I hate that that if that happens, and I hate that that happens. But I've never had the, the unfortunate aspect of that happening to us. Uh, if I've ever needed anything from from any kind of help from my from my leadership, yeah. and if you are a leader in your unit, then always take care of your subordinates. Always, hey, if there's a pay issue in your leader, you know, I got out to Texas one time and I was an E4, and there was an E2 who hadn't been paid. Man, I'm getting on a phone. I'm like, hey, man, you need to get this guy paid. Yeah. I mean, always, and that's the biggest. That's the most important thing in a guy's life is his paycheck. Yeah. So make sure that, make sure that a young soldier is getting paid. Yeah. Make sure that somebody's getting fed. And that's, that's the biggest thing is, mm. is just take care of, take care of your family and take care of someone else's family. If they're gone, you know, when somebody is gone and you know, they're leaving, Hey, if your wife or your, if they need something, call me and I'll handle it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it kind of goes back to the the community and, and knowing that absolutely but the family will take care of the family kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that's what we are. You 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 cut out a little bit. I apologize for the the connection issue. But uh, did did you say you had a horrendous accident where you got hit by a eighteen wheeler? Yeah. So I've actually had I've actually had I've actually been caught in dead three times. Uh, so in o two in o two I was uh, coming home. I was on counter drug. I was coming home from work. I got hit head on uh, by by a pickup truck. Then hit again by a second car. Went through the back windshield of a of my truck. Wow. And 2007 on a deployment, uh, we were there for seven days. Uh, we got ambushed, uh, and seven of us was called in dead before they could actually get back to us. We had E and E for about three hours. Wow. So my wife actually gets a call because they had, uh, evacuated some guys back and we had gotten a call saying, Hey, your husband did an ambush and we don't know where he's at. We don't know wow. if he's alive or not. Cause they had actually called us in. And then at 17, I was hit by an 18 wheeler. Uh, in the driver door, I was driving, was going to do a, a drug deal. Uh, and then they said, Hey, his car's on fire. He's probably not going to make it. You may want to get to the scene. So, uh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and that, that accident broke every bone from my pelvis to my neck and broke my neck in two places and every, every bone up. So, uh, so I've, uh, Un- yeah. So I have come full circle. I have been, uh, so uh, it's been uh, it's been a good ride, but never once has the military ever said, "Hey, man, we're not going to pay a bill. Hey, man, we're yeah. not gonna we're gonna take you off orders." Uh, they they take care of me every step of the way. Yeah, wow. I mean, yeah, but it's like you know, that's putting you through the ringer, but also the the emotional toll it takes. The on emotional the family. on your family. Yes, unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, but it looks like I mean, I see you. You're you're moving. You're. You, it looks like you've made full recoveries. 
oh yeah, yeah, I can run. I mean, I, I, I can run. I work out. I mean, obviously, I live with pain every day, but not. I mean, but I, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do tobacco or anything like that. So my body's in as far as that goes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't do anything, I don't do anything that's bad for your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, oh, praise praise God for making it through those those. Well, uh, that's a lot of healing. A lot of prayers and a lot of healing. Yeah. Uh, you'd be you'd be amazed at my story. So. Yeah, man, man. Um, so, uh, you know, I think you, you said uh, before the show, th- was it two or three deployments to Afghanistan? I've done two to Afghanistan, and I went uh, once into the Congo uh, on the Joseph Comey mission. Yeah, so I, I was looking at that briefly. I remember uh, Joseph Comey went back, I think it was in high school, when, when he was a subject. That was kind of like uh, Invisible Children. Um, yes. They were, yeah. So what was, what, I mean, that, that's a wasn't I don't feel like it was a super well known um, topic. I mean, maybe for a brief period of time. But uh, what what was that like? Where it was kind of you know not part of the the GWAT necessarily, but kind of an offshoot, uh, being in part of the special forces and having those opportunities. Is it as as you know glamorous? I think as a lot of people see as those special forces missions or. It, it actually, yeah, well, obviously it is a special forces mission uh, because, you know, a, a SF mission is trained, advised, and assist, right? Yeah. Uh, so Obama actually brought it back to the forefront when, when President Obama was back in because um, those who don't know who Joseph Coney is, he would he would go into villages. He actually started out a lot more to be a good guy. Right? The, the government was taking over there in, uh, in the Congo and in certain regions in uh, Uganda uh south sudan uh and they were revolting against the the government and so he was supposed to be a a good a good guy saying hey we're not going to do these things but then obviously with more power he becomes more bad Mm. but he would he started going in he would he would take boys and put them into his his army and he would take the girls and he would sell them as sex slaves well obviously that's not good yeah so he'd done this for uh, ever since the 70s right until up till still he, he may be dead now he's been this forever and so they took. They asked us to go in, and uh, and it's been going on for years. And uh, we kind of brought the mission back to the forefront because obviously new technology. I, I mean, I'm a SIGINT uh, intel guy, so we take different intelligence, you know, through radios and mm-hmm. other kind of signals, signals intelligence, and, yeah, 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 signals intelligence, and then we try to find people. Mm-hmm. And so he's unsophisticated to so use walkie-talkie and that kind of stuff. And so what we had this new technology that we actually took into theater and was testing and uh and so we were able to locate dudes from their location on some of his on some of his guys yeah. so we were one of the first ones to actually get into a lra lra is lower is the lowest is what his joseph coney's military is mm. and got it actually into the camp so so it's not a it's not a glamorous mission but it was one of the first jungle missions that had that twin had done in years and that the military had done in a long time so it's, it's pretty, I mean, what, what, the, the jungle's different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the jungle comes alive at night, and it's pretty dang scary. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty cool. Awesome. So you got out after 22 years, um, and how how did you transition? How, what was that transition like after such a long career uh, and, and trying to figure out what your civilian career was going to look like? So with the counter drug program, uh, once I got 15 – the program says at 20 years active duty, you've got to retire to sustain funding or whatever. So at 15, 16 years, I knew I was retiring at this, at this age. Right. So, so mentally I have to start preparing. What am I going to do next? Yeah. And so at, at Afghan or Africa was going to be my, that was my last deployment because there's a thing called sanctuary. So you can't deploy on, you know, you can't, I don't know if you know what sanctuary is. When you get 18 or six, 17 and a half years active duty, the military can't kick you out or mm-hmm. take you off orders, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I knew that that was my last appointment with the 20th group. I was going to stay on counter drug orders. And I knew at 20 years I was retiring. So I had to mentally start preparing myself for retirement. Mm. And that's kind of that's, that's kind of when my story goes as far as the last accident because being a man of faith, I'd never asked God what I was going to do. I started making my own plans, mm. you know, and that when you have a seven, an 18 year old son, I don't know if you have kids or not, but you, when, when you start, <laughs> do what? So one on the way. Not, oh, do you? Yeah. 
well, you know, but when you when you have the audacity to tell your son what he can and can't do, but you don't ask God what can I can't what should I shouldn't do, yeah. it doesn't go very well. Yeah. So it's put in my place as far as hey, what should I do? I never ask where should I go or what should I do. I was making my own plans. Mm. And so anyway, um, but people was asking me, are you going into politics because my personality because my career. I mean, you know, I obviously have a purple heart, you know, I've, I've been in an SF unit, the Intel for 20 years, my resume stacks up pretty well to, to go that route. Yeah. Are you going to own a business? Are you just going to go home and retire? You know, what's your, what's your plan? And mm. I just kept saying, I don't know what I'm going to do mm. without asking God, what should I do? Mm. Um, and so that accent put, put my life in perspective. Mm. And so, uh, so at any rate, I, I, I chose to, you know, I got into politics, um, so I'm a, I'm a, a county commissioner. Um, I do I do a lot of speaking at churches, um, uh, telling my story, witnessing. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of uh, you know, and and so the the military set me up for success. People around me, I haven't done anything. Man, my when I deployed to Africa, I, I went as a team sergeant to Africa. The people, my team made me successful. Mm. I didn't do anything, man. I mean, because, and I tell people whether I'm here, whether I'm not here, my guys are going to be successful. The leader is to blame, the team is there to get all the glory. Mm. Uh, when, when, when I go to, when I went to Africa, we were successful simply because the guys around us, our team was successful. And so I tell people, man, if you will put good people around you, you will be successful. If you instill success in them, and if, if I want, I want your show to be successful, not not to, for me to be successful because I'm indifferent. I mean, I'm irrelevant. Yeah, you're going to be successful because you're going to find the right people to get on here to to be successful. Mm. So go find good people, and you're going to want them to be to, to do the right thing. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, it, it's, it's a leadership characteristic that I feel like, um, you know, not every leader views it that way. Um, and so I think like that's, it's, uh, respectable. Cause you know, I think a lot of people, uh, that are on teams would kind of like complain about leadership, not viewing it that way, but, um, yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it's cool to see that it does exist in leadership positions. And so I think, um, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So you, so you ended up within politics. Uh, you said you're a small business owner also. Yeah. Uh, so I bought a, a sub convenience store, grocery store. It's kind of like a, you have dollar generals. So it's oh, kind of yeah, like a dollar general cool. with the gas bulbs. <laughs> cool. Good for you. Yeah. So and for some reason that, well, I say that, but for some reason I bought a job. I tell people, I'm like, what idiot buys a job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny. That's not usually what you think of when, uh, when you purchase it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I retired and bought a job. Okay. All right. Uh, was, was the transition like, was it difficult? I mean, I know, you know, it's, the transition is different for everybody. Um, but what, you know, having lived through it, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's maybe nearing their transition? For me, it was very hard. Mm. Uh, cause, cause the day I turned 18, I started working narcotics. The day I turned, I mean, I started working with these guys when I was 21, I joined the military. Right. So that was, that was my identity, mm. man. So that was who I was. Yeah. So putting that down, Right, not having an office to go to, not whenever I'm out in the public going, Hey, there's Jamie, he works narcotics, there's Jamie, he's in the military, not putting on a uniform mm. to go to drill. My identity, I hung up in a closet. Mm. And so, for man, I don't know, but it's probably still today. It is hard for me not to because the office I worked at was just right down the road. So, it is hard for me not to want to go by there. Yeah. I mean, and so I, I, as far as advice to give somebody, uh, it's not, I guess maybe it's not, it might be who you identify as who you, as who you are, but maybe it's not, I guess, who you, who you have to be. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess, but find some, something, 
go into something else. I mean, I, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out, I guess, because mm-hmm. it yeah. is when, when I did it half my life. I yeah. mean, when, when it's who you are for half your life. Uh, and and I, maybe that's why I'm in politics so that I can stay involved because I want to stay involved with with the community. I want to stay involved with things that are going on uh, because that's uh, and I guess that's cliche to say that's who I am. But yeah. but mentally, I just I just I want to be part of something bigger than me. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I could I could own a business and try to make tons of money, or I could sit in my house all day and never go see anybody. Yeah. But I just I have this instinct that says i want to be part of something bigger than i am yeah i i think i mean i can definitely relate to that is you know we're all trying to find an identity and it's so so often that we find our identity in our career and then the the military on top of that adds its own whole version of identity and so i i think that's a that's an interesting you know it's an interesting point to kind of connect to the difficulty of the transition out is because you 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 do you pretty much overnight hanging up in the closet and yeah it you kind of have to separate yourself from that identity um so yeah that's yeah I, that's not a good answer for you uh, <laughs> no, no, it's not a bad answer you, it's yeah, a real answer you know? something, yeah you may have been looking for something better but I, I don't know man it was it was it's you know and there's some people who there's and i see people every day it's like man i was so ready to get out or i was so ready for this man but but for me it's it's it was just it was just hard. Uh, yeah. and I will say that it's still hard. I mean, it's not like it just, it crushes you, but it's just, it's just, I don't know. It's just, it was just different for me. Yeah. I mean, even the people that say they look forward to getting out and they're ready for it, like they can, they can still find themselves in that same situation where it's like, yeah, I thought I was ready for this and I looked forward to it, but it, it's still a, it's still, you know, um, a big part of your life that you're hanging up in a closet. And so you have to go yeah. find, find that identity in something else. Um, or, you know, like, it's almost like recreating yourself, you know, yeah. <laughs> oddly enough. And so, um, you know, n- not to say that it can't be done, uh, and not to say that it's always an easy transition or, or even always a difficult transition. Um, yeah. you know, everybody, everybody kind of deals with it in their own way. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, a- after 22 years, is it something that you would recommend to, you know, your children or, you know, anybody else? Oh, ab- absolutely, man. I think, uh, I think the military is, is by far one of the best discipline. discipline. I mean, I th- we, we kid every day. I mean, man, kids need to go to boot camp. Mm. Kids need to go to boot camp so that they can realize that this world is not just about them. Yeah. That you got to be places, you, you have to be somewhere on time. Yeah. You know, you, you, you're not going to, you're not going to die without your phone. <laughs> and when somebody tells you to do something, it's not because there, there, they, there may not be a reason behind it that you don't understand right now. Mm. I mean, there's nothing wrong with just doing what somebody tells you to do. Yeah. And learning from it. Yeah. Uh, and everybody wants free education. We'll go to, if you go and if you join the military, you'll get it. <laughs> yeah. <that's true> too. <laughs> I mean, I mean, everybody's, everybody's screaming, uh, I want, I want free, free college. Well, yeah. join the army or, or the Marines. Yeah. Join Whatever the services brand. and you'll yeah. get it. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big advocate for that too. It's, you know, the, the, the student loan, you know, <laughs> debt bubble is, uh, is, you know, kind of crushes everybody my age. And so it wasn't even something that I had, I had planned like, Oh, I'm doing it for college or something like that. But, um, you know, in hindsight, it was like, the, you know, the best decision I could have made. Otherwise I'd be, I'd be strapped it, it, as everybody. Well, else. you know what I think a lot about. I mean, I got a lot of. I got three cousins in the military now, mm-hmm. uh, and man, and I, I give it, I give them kudos because they're joining knowing, because especially if you joined ten years ago, you joined knowing you got a nine percent chance of going to war. Yeah, you know, I mean, when I joined, I didn't think nothing about it, but <laughs> you join now, and you, you you're going. Yeah. You know, and so you, where it's like, man, I mean, how, how, mindset wise, it's a, it's a lot different. And so, so you have to give a lot of, a lot of credit to these young, young men, especially like I said, in the last, last 10 years or before who, who joined no one, I, I'm joining no one, I'm going. Mm. Mm. And so I have a lot of respect for those, for, for those men and women. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and you know, it's kind of like, 
you know, we, we kind of joke about like it being free college, but <laughs> it's still not free, you know, you know, it's it's, not, no, I was, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, not free. Bob Sam. Yeah. It's it. Yeah. At that point, if, if you're making that, um, that agreement, it's, you know, it's more of a transaction. Um, but yes. at, at the same time, yeah. I mean, like, you know, it's a give and take and, um, there are ways to kind of, uh, leverage the opportunity to make sure that you're, you're better off in the long run. Um, yeah. and most of the time it's fun while you're doing it too. So, I mean, I, I've loved every minute of it, man. I mean, obviously there's been some days it's like, you know, this is terrible, but a lot more, a lot more fun than not. I can yeah. assure you. Yeah. Well, but it's obviously, it's all career choice though. I mean, it's obviously, it's all MOS choice. Hmm. It's all what you do once you get in there. And, uh, and I tell people, uh, they're like, Oh, should I do it? I'm like, you know, if you want to be in the suck, you're going to like it when you're there. Uh, if you're going somewhere and you're not going to lie, I don't care. Watch your shoes. Yeah. If you don't want to be there, you're going to hate it. Yeah. It's mindset. And you're probably not going to, yeah. And you're probably not going to like it while you're there, no matter what. I mean, you, your mom makes you go to college. Well, you're not going to like it while you're there. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's something to be said for that. Yeah. If you're making the decision because you want to do it, you're going to find the good in it. But yeah, if some, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. If so, if your mom's making you go to college, you're probably gonna hate college too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to if, you know speak on that a little bit. Um, you know, you said like some days are great and you have a, a blast, and some days just kind of suck. And um, you know, with within your your comfort zone of talking about kind of like what that spectrum looks like. Um, you know, the things that you loved about the military the most versus the things that you just like, you know didn't i won't say hated but uh didn't like about the military you know well i mean i could i could just go on and on about what i love about the military man i mean i talk about from from the travel obviously everybody loves per diem uh, <laughs> you know what i'm saying i mean i just there's there's not any there's not i, I could just i i love the training i mean obviously because my mos mm. but uh i got to i got to always stay on top of technology yeah right? uh, we were always doing new equipment training uh, whether it be in DC or in Florida, I mean, we were always training on new equipment. Mm. And so we were always, and we always had funding for it being an NSF unit. So we was always, mm. I mean, and then with the counter drug program, we were always traveling, doing, doing, doing training. Uh, and then obviously in the national guard, uh, you would just have to say what you didn't like about it was, was drill weekend because it was always on <laughs> it was always on a on a weekend you had something to do <laughs> yeah yeah you know and exactly. they, they never had anything never had anything trained for planned for you to do for training you know it was always go start some equipment so go start the trucks and or yeah. we're going to do phas or something dumb uh -huh. <laughs> it's like seriously <laughs> Uh, yeah yeah that's so funny I, I i tell a lot of people that when they join they're thinking about joining the reserves or the guard or something like that and i'm like man like i feel like you have to join active duty first to to get the appreciation for it. otherwise that one week in a month is always going to be an inconvenience you know yeah uh, yeah and, and and to go and to have to do the one week in a month even though you're active duty it adds a whole nother component to it you know it's just a weekend that you kind of get robbed <laughs> yeah Oh. Yeah, but but yeah, that that probably be the, the, I mean, but in the beginning, I mean, when, when you're young, you probably don't mind the weekend a month because it's just it's just at a party weekend for you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You just go and hang out with your buddies. Yeah, you can stay up half the night, and who cares what you're doing? Yeah. You know, but once you get older, it's just like <laughs> ah, my son had a ball game this weekend, or with something crazy. Mm. You know, and it just kind of gets in the way. But I'm telling you. Uh, and of course, I was an extra regular M day, you know, for 20 years. I was always on orders doing something. So, yeah. And that's the thing about if you get the right unit, man, you can, we call it guard bomb. I mean, you can, you can guard bomb and do so much if you have the right MOS. Yeah. And that's what I tell people. I'm like, get your ass valve score good. Don't let the recruiter tell you what you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. Go in there, tell them what you want to do and what you're going to do and, and, and have the right MOS. Yeah. Uh, but it's all about you. It's all about your eyes bounce score. It's all about how well you are and how prepared you are when you go in. Yeah, and make that decision. So true. You, you mentioned the term guard bum. Um, <laughs> I, I, I we know what it is, but explain it a little bit. What what is what is a guard bum? <laughs> yeah, so guard bum is just when you want to ride off. You, you, you want to ride on orders and get paid. It's just uh, it's just being. It's just it's just getting paid by the military. It's just okay. I want to go two weeks on orders and go do some training, uh, or maybe even two months on orders when the, when your unit has some funds. 
so you may go uh, you may go to training uh, in another state for a little while, yeah. or if the state has some extra funds at your unit uh, and get on your unit orders for for a week, two weeks, uh, or yeah. two months. Uh, it's just uh, we just we just bum off the guard and get paid. <laughs> Yeah, you, you sign a like a part time contract, but then just kind of like keep raising your hands for different volunteer opportunities, and before you know it, absolutely, you're, you're basically full time. You know, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> right. There's there's a lot of people loving that right now during during COVID and all the all the opportunities for orders that COVID COVID brings. Oh golly, bomb! Yeah, <laughs> Man, you're not kidding, and it's a good it's it's, it's a good spot to be in. Yeah, you know, as I say, if you, have, I mean, if, if you got a lot that makes it makes all right, I mean, it's, it's a good spot to be in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like, it's so unique because you know, within the guard, I mean, they can call you up for so many different things, and so it's not you're not likely going to be doing the same thing every day for the for four years. You know, you're going to be doing, you know, like <laughs> I think uh, Jake was talking about how he got called up during a snowstorm, and it's like, yeah. Uh, covid or an inauguration you know it's it's always something different if you're willing to go man if you're willing to go do something and like i said like if, if you're willing to go to a, a hurricane or if you're willing to if you're if you're willing to work mm. and you're willing to show some leadership skills and you're willing just to go get in it yeah. if you're willing to do those things man your unit's going to call you yeah and yeah. they're going to put you on orders and then some are good some are bad <laughs> it's just it's just like it's just like playing dice it's just, it just depends on what you roll yeah yeah so true <laughs> so true with, with that said i'm curious um you know you're to get a, a comparison of the your favorite place that the military sent you versus your least favorite uh man i got so many favorites i mean uh because i like i like deploying obviously overseas to I mean, but just because of the bonds that you build with guys. Yeah. Uh, but I'd have to say, obviously, my favorite would be we had to take some equipment down to Central America. Uh, we had a team down there. So, I mean, obviously, when you fly on a private jet down to Central America, you get on a on a boat and you go out to one of the islands and look at it and say, that's probably the best. Yeah. I'll tell you where we went. Uh, and then probably, uh, I'd say probably the worst would be Fort Polk. <laughs> <laughs> Fort Polk, Fort Polk where, Louisiana. Where that? I've never been there. <laughs> It's that it's down Louisiana. It's just this it's just this little hole in the wall hole in the wall county of Louisiana. We had to do some training down there and there was nothing there. Gotcha. It was terrible. Four Polk, Louisiana. <laughs> but I could name a thousand good places. I mean, yeah. you know, we were going to going to Africa and we stopped in uh in Spain for you know like twenty six hours. Cool. Uh, that yeah, that town didn't stay the same. It ain't the same anymore. <laughs> <laughs> when you got when you got about forty SF dudes in there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, no curfew. We're glad we got back on the plane. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. Land, create havoc, and then get out. <laughs> whether it be on liberty or on, in, on the job, it's basically the same. That's, yeah, that's, that's like we were herding cats about 6 a.m. the next morning. It's like, dude, we got to get on the plane to get over there. <laughs> like, oh, man. <laughs> but it was funny. Too funny. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jamie. Any, uh, do you have any closing wisdom that you'd like to impart on you know, the current generation that's, you know, thinking about it? Uh, well, as far as wisdom, man, uh, just know this world is not about you. Uh, just, just put, just, 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 just be nice and just know there once in a while you can put the phone down, uh, get involved with the world. Uh, the military is a good thing. Uh, it, it's sometimes you got to sacrifice, uh, to get the good out of it. Yeah. And, uh, and just keep on living, man there you go awesome thanks jamie i appreciate your story appreciate your service and uh thanks for the time hey thanks for having me on